This program was brought to you by Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third day of SMI Conference 2021. And this morning, we are going to have an invited session for statistical methods for functional neural imaging. Uh, so I'm Ingo. I'm a faculty at the uh, Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Emory University. So I'll be chairing the session today. So the session is about statistical methods for functional neural imaging. So functional imaging has been probably the most commonly used and most popular methods to study human brain function and organization. So today we're very lucky to have uh, three experts in this area and to talk about their research and they'll talk about different type of imaging modalities and different type of methods to tackle these kind of problems. So without further ado, uh, I'll start introducing our first speaker. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, each speaker will have 20 minutes presentation time. So um, we probably will ask you to hold your question during their presentation. You can send it in chat box and we'll call it out uh, to you in the floor discussion period after the session. And you can also use the raise hand option during the floor discussion and we'll call out to you. Okay, thank you. So our first speaker today is Dr. Holanda Ombo, and Holanda is a professor of statistics at COST and currently chair of the statistics program there. He is the PI of the Biostatistics Research Group, and uh, Holanda's research uh, is focusing on statistical methods for time series with dynamic and complex structure. So before he came to uh, COST, Holanda was a faculty member at UC Irvine, Brown University, University of Illinois, and University of Pittsburgh. And he has received a, a various awards. For example, at UC Irvine, he, he was a recipient of the Mid-Career Distinguished Research Award. And Holanda is a co-editor of the Handbook of Statistical Methods for Neuroimaging. And he is also the AE of various uh, statistical journals, including JASA, JISSB, and Holando is a permanent member of the NIH Biostatistics Study Session, also called the BMRD section. He's a founding member and the previous chair of the Statistics in Imaging section and a fellow of ASA. So Holando, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ying. So I can share my screen now, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I hope you can you can see the the screen. I cannot do the uh, the full view because I have issues with uh, navigating from one from one page to another. So I'm going to have to do it this way. Um, thanks again, Ying, for organizing this uh, session and in fact the the entire uh, conference uh, along with Supratik and uh, and and Ben. Uh, so my talk today is on exploring dependence in multivariate time series. And so this is motivated by work on electroencephalograms where we're interested uh, to see uh, how uh, activity in one sensor, in fact, may be explained by activity in another sensor at a uh, previous time point. Uh, this work is in joint collaboration with Marco Pinto, who is uh, um, a student at Oslo uh, Metro University uh, in, uh, in Norway, and I'm hoping that uh, Marco will be joining my group as a postdoc uh, uh, very soon. Yeah, so, so here, this is a, uh, in this uh, figure, uh, this is like the brain in, in a particular angle. So you can see um, there's a, uh, inside the brain in the, uh, in, in the cortex, we have these uh, uh, source signals, which we, we do not observe, but we observe these signals that are propagated onto the scalp. And so we have channel one, channel two. And um, our goal here is to just look at the, the dependent structure in the sensor signals rather than the source signals. So one way to model dependence is as follows. If, if I'm interested in, uh, in modeling dependence between X1 and X2, these are the, the two observed signals. One way to do that is to take a look at the cross correlation, mutual information, and so on between these signals, X1 and X2. However, those are, I would say, global measures of dependence, because if the dependence between these two is, is high, 
then one of the questions we ask is, uh, what is the frequency oscillation that drives that dependence? So we want something that's, that's a bit more frequency uh, specific. And so um, here we introduce uh, an approach, a general approach uh, under which many of the different established dependency measures are, are actually uh, uh, can, be, um, can be cast under this general framework. And so one way to do it is we decompose X1 and X2 into different oscillations from low, middle to high frequencies. And by the way, the decomposition the, the according to the Fourier is just one of the pos many possible decompositions. We can also do wavelet decompositions and other types. Um, and so uh, instead of modeling dependence between X1 and X2 globally, then we model dependence according to each of these different frequency oscillations. So we look at the dependence between the delta uh, component in one and also the delta component in the other and so on and so forth. So this is the general uh, framework. So here, uh, here is an example. Okay, we, if we have the one on top is the observed uh, signal. As you can see, depending on the points in time, certain frequency bands are much more um, prominent. And so we can decompose um, the, the, blue, uh, the blue time series, that's the original signal, into the low, middle, and high frequency components. Okay, the purple is the, the uh, theta, uh, component, the green one is the beta, and the red one is, is gamma, the, the high, high frequency uh, oscillations. So if I look at just correlation, so if I have two channels um, on, the, um, uh, on the left uh, frontal uh, lobe and on the O2 is a right, on the right occipital uh, lobe, then we can compute the correlation between F3 and O2, okay, that's 0.547. And as I said, um, uh, this is quite a, a, a good a high uh, value of correlation, high, high, high uh, amount of dependence. And so we might want to ask ourselves, okay, what is driving this dependence? So for example, we can take a look at the theta waves, okay, the theta decomposition. And if I look at now the dependency in terms of the theta waves, then the cross correlation squared um, with the, um, with, with uh, sorry, uh, yeah, a cross correlation squared in terms of the theta waves is 0.541. We can also take a look at the beta waves. These are the slightly higher um, oscillations. Now it's 0.122. And then we can decompose it from the delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. And as you can see here, the correlation of 0 0.541 um, is quite high, and however, uh, it is really mostly um, the, the the greatest contributor to this. In fact, is the the delta, uh, and I mean the the, the theta oscillation. Okay? And so, um, so the goal here is is uh, is really that where if the dependency is high, then we want to identify what is a frequency band that uh, explains that dependency first of all, and then secondly is that. The dependency, we want to generalize it from simple linear types of dependence into others that, that can accommodate functionals, functionals of these oscillations. So as I was saying, um, the goal is to explore dependence between X1 and X2. And here we uh, propose a framework, which is for X1 and X2, we decompose that into the different uh, frequency oscillations, low, middle, high frequency. And then we want to model dependence between, for example, different frequency oscillations, such as the theta oscillation in X1 and the gamma oscillation in another. So this talk is really based in large part from our, my, uh, our, our joint paper uh, with Marco Pinto, which is on spectral, the title of spectral dependence, and it's currently under review, and this is the archive uh, link. So we'd like to just show for now how the old concepts, in fact, can be explained under this framework. So if I have the Kramer representation, if you have a stationary time series X1 and X2, you can decompose that into the Fourier waveforms, these complex exponentials, with random coefficients dz1 and dz2. Okay? And um, um, uh, now we can also discretize this integral by um, by um, 
uh, looking at frequency bands rather than singleton frequencies. And then we can express X1 and X2 as a sum of these different frequency components, di different oscillations. Now, coherence between X1 and X2 at frequency omega is in fact equal to the modulus square of the correlation of their corresponding random uh, amplitudes. So this is the formal definition of coherence. But in fact, this can also be motivated, as I said, by something more intuitive where I look at their frequency oscillations. So in fact, if I define X1 omega at time t and X2 omega at time t to be exactly this Fourier waveform multiplied by the random coefficient, the same thing with X2, uh, the Fourier waveform multiplied by the random coefficient, then it turns out that the correlation between these, these two uh, oscillations is in fact, it, it boils down to just the correlation squared between the, between the random coefficients. The reason for that is the, the complex exponentials, if I take the correlation, uh, take modulus square of them, they, they cancel out. So because you're looking at the, the E multiplied by its complex conjugate, so they cancel out. Okay, so, so therefore, really coherence under the very classical, uh, uh, the, the, the classical definition of coherence can also be explained, in fact, by, uh, by this idea, which in my mind is a bit, a bit more intuitive, okay, uh, because people are familiar with, with, uh, with time domain dependence. And so if I can represent my original time series in terms of different oscillations, now I can model dependence between these oscillations in however way I want. And um, so one of them is by looking at the correlation, modulus correlation squared. So in fact, our old paper 2008 um, already explains this idea under the uh, non-stationary setting. So for those of you who are um, uh, working on the, 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 the spectrum, when, when, when we wrote this paper in 2008, it was pointed out by one referee that this idea was already, um, was already used way back 100 years ago uh, by an American engineer, uh, electrical engineer, where he in fact uh, showed that one way to compute the spectrum, one way to estimate the spectrum is in fact by filtering. So you obtain all these different oscillations and sim simply take the variance of the different frequency oscillations. So we know that the variance of the time series X1 is in the integral of the spectrum. So you're adding all of these spectral uh, values uh, over frequency. Um, but however, the variance of X of X1 is also equal to the variance the, the integral of the variance of all of the different frequency oscillations. And so therefore the spectrum is in fact ortho, uh, proportional to the variance explained by each of these different frequency oscillations. Okay. So the total, variance, the, the total variance in the time series is just the sum of the variances contributed by each of the different frequency oscillations. So this idea in fact was already known like in 1898. So, so back to here, um, we'd like to model uh, dependence from a spectral point of view, which is that we're looking at different frequency oscillations. And so if I'm interested, so you, are, you already saw this equation for X1 and X2, this from a representation. So if I want to model dependence between X1 and X2, I model the dependence between the sums. So the first sum is X1, the second sum corresponds to X2. And under stationarity, the different frequency oscillations, in fact, uh, if I'm looking at the dependency between omega one and omega two, then those actually are, are uncorrelated. And therefore, the covariance in the time series is, in fact, the sum of the covariances according to the different frequency oscillations. And so, therefore, the covariance in the time domain is a global measure. And now you can take a look at the covariances contributed according to the different frequencies. So this is a bit more of a local, uh, a local measure. Okay. However, under uh, under uh, stationarity, as I was saying earlier, you know that uh, one can only look at the same frequency oscillation. So the um, omega k oscillation in x1 and omega k oscillation in in um, x2. Um, so the um, the limitation of covariance in the time domain is that it's unable and able to identify the specific oscillations that drive that dependence, okay, as shown here. Okay. Now, um, uh, so as I was saying, um, the um, uh, coherence is already, can be explained under that framework of looking at the uh, oscillations. 
And you've already seen this picture, I'll skip it in, in the interest uh, of time. Now, the, uh, the other measure is that of partial coherence. So with partial coherence, if you have a p-dimensional time series uh, with spectral matrix f of x here, now partial coherence is derived by taking the inverse of this uh, spectral matrix, and then you, you, uh, uh, you standardize it by pre and post multiplying by a diagonal matrix. Okay? But nevertheless, you have to invert uh, the spectral matrix. And uh, um, so one of the challenges, of course, in estimating partial coherence is that when this matrix, uh, when there's a high uh, uh, level of multipollinearity in my time series, then this matrix may be close to singular. And it, it may have a very poor condition um, number. And so one way to, to solve this problem is by regular, re regularization in term for estimating the, the spectral matrix. And so Mark Fekas did some, some work on this where the estimator is well-conditioned and it's in fact semi-parametric. It's a weighted average of the non-parametric periodogram, mildly smooth periodogram matrix estimator and a... Um, sometimes a diagonal uh, matrix uh, or a uh, matrix that's actually obtained from a parametric uh, form. So it's a semi-parametric in that sense. So, however, um, this particular, again, idea of partial correlation, classical one, can also be explained under this framework of, um, of looking at oscillations. In fact, the partial coherence between x1 and x2 at frequency omega is nothing but the conditional cross correlation between the omega oscillations of x1 and x2 condition on the other omega oscillations of x3 x4 all the way to xp modulo squared okay. and so again it's the old idea uh, but now just trying but explained in this uh, uh, using the concept of, of filtering of these oscillations now, um, so there's another uh, another idea is that of um, uh, dual frequency coherence. So under uh, under stationarity, I was, as I was saying, the dependence between uh, different frequency oscillations, omega one and omega two, if they're different, they're, they're zero. Um, but um, under non-stationarity, then there may be dependence between them. And so one might want to look at the dependence between the alpha oscillation and the gamma oscillation, for example. So how does the amplitude of, uh, of the alpha activity in one time series, how is that associated with, let's say, the amplitude of gamma activity in another time series? Is there an excitation effect? Is there an inhibition effect? And so um, we, uh, th this um, new, new angle to looking at this problem, uh, um, in fact, um, um, so looking at this concept, it's an old one uh, that's been proposed by Loewe in the 1950s, where you have this harmonizable processes, where now this DZ of omega is there allowed to be correlated across different frequencies. Okay? So you have dual frequency because you can take a look at dependence between uh, omega uh, DZ omega one and DZ omega two. So in our work with Gorostieta, we also allow this dual frequency coherence to evolve uh, evolve over time. But again, so this idea is still really, uh, you can take a look at it from, from the framework that we just introduced, where you simply take the beta, uh, the gamma oscillation in one, the theta oscillation in the other, and then you, 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 um, you model dependence between them, such as the cross correlation squared between these two components. Now, the limitations so far of what we've done uh, what, so far is that they, uh, they, there's no uh, notion of lead lag dependence. This is quite important in neuroimaging, right? That we want to be able to, to see whether it is the past activity of one that helps to explain the future activity of, of another. And now this is in fact already uh, 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 addressed by uh, the notion of partial directed coherence by Bakala and Samishima uh, in, in early 2000. So here they fit a vector autoregressive model, but the limitation between that is is that um, uh, under the Bakala and Samishima model, the, the lead lag dependence between different frequency components are assumed to be the same. Okay, so if delta leads gamma by, by five time points, now um, 
uh, if, uh, if, if sorry, if, if delta at channel one leads delta at channel two by five time points, then delta at channel three will lead delta at channel five by also the same number of time points. Okay? So, so you, you, you fix these, uh, these lags. However, it may be possible that different frequency oscillations may in fact a different lead lag dependent structure. So that's the limitation of Bakala and Samishima. But as you can already imagine, under this filtering uh, oscillation framework, you can play around with this lead lag dependence. And this is where we have, in fact, this spectral causality uh, idea, okay, where um, we apply a one-sided filter on the time series, one-sided because you want to be able to predict the, 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 the future. And under this, un uh, under this, one can take a look at dependency between different frequency oscillations, also different frequency bands. So for the moment, we fit a vector autoregressive model on the frequency uh, on the frequency component. So we want to see how alpha activity in one may be explained by alpha activity in all the other channels present uh, 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 past uh, uh, past time points, as well as the beta oscillations, gamma oscillations, and so on. So as you can imagine too, now this one will lead to an explosion of, 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 an, of the number of parameters. So the VAR model alone is already very high dimensional. The, it's the number of parameters is of the order P squared times L. P is the number of channels. L is the, the lag uh, in the VAR model. But here you even multiply that by, by five, by 10, depending on the number of frequency bands you're looking at. And uh, so, but there are ways to, uh, to deal with it. Um, so there's, you can do regularization. Uh, for example, you can do Bayesian's spike and slab prior. Now, the, um, so in the interest of time, I'll just show this uh, uh, example where we have an, uh, this uh, EEG uh, multi-subject. So the, um, the, uh, the, it's a word generation uh, data. So the task is they're given, they're shown some letter and then they have to think about uh, what kind of uh, letter begins with, for example, uh, what, what, what word might begin with the letter W. And so here playing around with the spectral causality idea, then we give us an example here, we have four different uh, channels. And then we can, we, uh, here we, oh, we, we, we plotted the, um, the coefficients. Uh, that actually uh, with p values that are lower than 10 to the minus five. Okay, so we just pick a, an arbitrarily small number. It's, it's very exploratory at this point, but um, so can, this is just the, the we just use this, uh, this tool to illustrate uh, for this particular data set. Now uh, I'll, I'll end uh, uh, in, in a minute here. Now one also can look at these nonlinear relationships. So for example, one can take a look at the, uh, the model dependency between X1 and X2. Then one can take a look at expectations of functionals of X1 omega one and a functional of X2 omega one. So if H1 and H2 are the identity, we're back to just coherency or coherence. But if I look at, let's say, the second order, the absolute value, whatever, then we can explore these different dependency structures, visual information, copulas, and also that of phase amplitude coupling. So for example, we can say the amplitude of gamma one at time point T in one channel may be a function of the phase of the other, of the other time series. So there is the, 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 the theta gamma, the well-known theta gamma, gamma coupling for, for EEGs and local field potential. So we have a toolbox uh, that one can play with, you know, these different ideas. The, the software leader here is uh, Marco Pinto. And I think that's it. Uh, again, thanks to Ying, Supertik, and, and Ben, and also the ASA section on imaging. So our next speaker is Dr. Brian Caffel. Um, Brian is a full professor of biostatistics at Johns Hopkins University, and his research areas include statistical computing, generalized linear mix models, neuroimaging, imaging processing, and the analysis of big data. So Brian has created and led a team that won the ADHD 200 prediction competition, which is a very fierce competition with many teams from different discipline areas. And he was the recipient of the presidential earlier career award for scientists and engineers, which is the highest award given by the US government for early career researchers in STEM fields. Um, Brian has co-created co and co-directed the uh, SMART group at Hopkins, which is very well known in our 
field and focusing on statistical methodology for biological signals. He also co-created and co-directs the data science specialization, which is a very popular mock mini degree on data analysis and computing, and having over 3 million enrollments, which is really impressive. So I think, uh, Brian, you can start your presentation. Brian, you are muted. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, th thanks for the very nice introduction and, and, and invitation. And uh, uh, thanks to the conference organizers. Uh, and it, it, it's really nice to see everyone. I'm going to start my timer to make sure I don't go over. Uh, there we go. OK, so I'm going to talk today about covariance regressions, uh, covariance regression for connectome outcomes. And I'm going to pretend like what I'm talking about is stuff that I did, but I didn't do any of it. Uh, really, the the key people were uh, Yi Zhao, uh, Bing Kai Wang, and and Bo Hao Tang, and um, it's really it's really their work. And and I think I, I especially want to point out uh, Yi, who uh, who I think is in the audience, um, uh, so she can correct me when I make mistakes. Um, uh, has really built on this method. So if you want to see some some generalizations, some uh, so so what I'm talking about is a little bit old news. So some very nice generalizations uh, she's done since then uh, um, have come out as well. Um, so the what I what I'm generically interested, not just in neuroimaging, is ways in which we can couple parsimonious models like regression with more complex models. Uh, like neural networks or uh, decompositions or anything like that. So I, I think one of the keys to getting at this idea of explainability in machine learning, um, you know, you know, one route is the route that I think is popular right now, which is to look at the sort of innards of the machine learning algorithm. But another route I think is to think about how the output of the machine learning algorithm or output of the decomposition then relates to more uh, parsimonious existing models. And so that's one of the ways I like to think about kind of modern explainability in machine learning. And I, I like to think about it, especially with regard to um, uh, fMRI. Um, but specifically in terms of regression, I think we all know there's many different ways to think about regression. The classic method dating back to Legendre being uh, thinking about projections, uh, but of course you could also think of it as a maximization under a, a, a Gaussian log likelihood of a particular form. Uh, the way I like to teach regression is I like to teach it as iteratively applying regression through the origin. So that way when I teach students, they don't need to know any linear algebra, just sums and things like that. Uh, and, and of course you could iteratively apply any, any collection of the regressors. You don't have to do them one at a time but I think that's an, a nice way to think about regression as well. Uh, you can think of regression as a conditional estimate based on uh, joint normality of the regressors and the predictors. Um, and, uh, and of course, you can also think of it as, an, as a moment equation. We often teach regression as if normality is required, but of course, um, of course it's not. Uh, the, it's, it's quite, uh, the asymptotics are quite favorable for regression under a correctly specified mean model. Um, and there's all sorts of generalizations. I'm just picking up on a couple right now. Uh, one that uh, one application of generalizations of regression that's particularly relevant to what I'm going to talk about today uh, is a is a pretty old paper by Worsley, Pauline, Friston, and Evans on uh, characterizing the response of PET and fMRI data using multivariate linear models. And what they did in this paper is they did a they chose a, a outcome transformation, a linear outcome transformation that then reduce the high dimensional outcome to a smaller dimensional uh, regression model. Uh, but then they, they, chose the, the, uh, they chose that matrix that reduced the outcome. They chose it so that the regression model fit better, uh, not unlike techniques like partial least squares. Um, so that was, I think, a really early attempt in, 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 this, in this area. Uh, and uh, our, our, our uh, change is really going to be in looking at uh, uh, connectivity matrices. So just a really quick explanation of a connectivity matrix. I'm going to gloss over all the details. Imagine we have fMRI, so we have these, these much fuzzier looking um, uh, brain images uh, collected, you know, every one to two seconds, maybe at rest. Uh, 
um, you know, then we, we can put them into a matrix, let's say with voxels on the columns and time down the, down the rows. And then we might take specific locations as seeds or regions or parcels. And we might take the average of, of these regions or, or seeds and to get these little black strips of, of, of interest out of it. And then we might take the, the correlation matrix associated with those to get a connectivity matrix. And that's the central object of study that we're going to be talking about. The connectivity matrix is a, is, is a, key, uh, a key object of study in fMRI uh, in the sense that it, 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 uh, we can do things like try to derive areas of the brain that tend to uh, coordinate or areas of the, the brain that tend to work antagonistically. Um, and so it, it, much of, of what we do in intersubject analysis of resting state fMRI is to simply look at this, at this matrix. Um, and what I am interested in then is treating this matrix as an outcome. Uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of methods are available when we have a positive definite symmetric matrix outcome? What variations on regression are, um, are possible? Um, and, and two broad approaches that we thought of when we were thinking about it, we have this really wonderful working group that meets on, on Friday with, with Rossi and, and Yi and, and, and Bing Kai. Um, and it, it's really fun. It's really a highlight of the week for me. Two methods that we talked about for, um, uh, for, for addressing this problem. One was to, and, and they very much so correspond to this kinds of things people do for regressors, high dimensional regressors. You could do some kind of PCA to the regressors first, uh, and then without considering the model, um, or you could try to do some kind of um, PCA that actually uh, corresponds to the model. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about these two potential decisions. So in terms of doing PCA first, we thought about, oh, well, well, we want some parsimony in our PCA decomposition. So the parsimony that we picked is uh, um, that the um, decomposition, um, is, the eigenvectors are consistent across subjects, whereas the eigenvalues are idiosyncratic. So, you, you know, if I was being lazy and instead of drawing the data was just to draw a bunch of ellipses, um, and, and, and what we're kind of assuming and, uh, and ignoring variation is that, is that the rotation, the principal directions are, are, the, are, are the same across subjects, but the eigenvalues vary. Here, just one of the eigenvalues is varying. Um, but, 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 and then we might do regression on the logarithm of the uh, varying eigenvalues per subject. Now, of course, you, this isn't the only subject, this isn't the only assumptions you could make. You could make this assumption where the eigenvalues are constant, but the eigenvectors uh, vary across subjects. But I, I think in neuroimaging, certainly the top one is more consistent. Um, it, it, it corresponds to our understanding that networks are fairly consistent across subjects, but maybe the engagement in those networks are not so consistent across subjects. So it, it both corresponds to our interest and kind of what we think of as, as valid neuroscientific theory. And of course, that's been highly validated by work like uh, Vince Calhoun's work, who's talking later on today on group ICA, who, who really uh, is, is, is the leader in that, in that area of thinking. Um, so what, what we built on this uh, common PCA model that originated from a statistician named Fleury. Uh, so we, our generalization assumes partially common eigenvalues, so only some of the eigenvalues are common. So because we only assume some of the eigenvalues are common, we have to estimate the number of common components. And then we, we proved asymptotic conditions as time and the number of su subjects goes to infinity under semi-parametric assumptions. Of course, you need much stronger assumption as time goes to infinity for one subject than you need as subjects goes to infinity for a fixed time point. Uh, the, the time one actually it reduces to fairly strong assumptions, not that different from Fleury's original uh, likelihood-based assumptions. Uh, so you would get things like this, where you get uh, eigenvectors, you know, if you were to do the motor network in a motor task, you get eigenvectors that uh, load in the relevant areas uh, associated uh, in the motor network associated with the, the, the correct limbs. Uh, the issue with that is that we found that the, um, the search space was too big and that it wasn't finding areas that were correctly tuned to our regressors. So we, we thought about instead going to the model where we look at the rotation in a way that it's 
connected to the regression model itself. So conceptually thinking about a model where the log of some uh, uh, of a, a rotation of the person specific connectivity matrix then satisfies a linear model so that we call that covariate assisted principal components regression. So in the uh, likelihood, then we not only um, solve uh, for the coefficients, but we also solve for the rotations. Um, I'll just briefly put up um, put up an equation to pretend like I can still do equations, but here's the likelihood that we look at it's sort of like a Weibull. Uh, it's a Weibull type likelihood and we have constraints that are similar to the typical uh, principal component constraints. Um, we've tried it both with the principal components constraints and with a, uh, a centering matrix based on the data and we found that the centering matrix based on the data, the, those, uh, that generalization of the orthogonality constraints of the uh, of the uh, eigenvectors is, is probably preferable. So this is a variation of common principal components, but where, um, but where we're finding the rotations in a way that it, um, it corresponds to the um, regression model. So um, again, because it's partially common principal components, we have to figure out a way to guess the number of common components and the number of idiosyncratic components. So we use Flurry's deviation from diagonality to do that. And here's just some simulation studies showing that when we have two components, we found that there were two components and we, and we validated the asymptotics uh, of the model um, of, the beta, of the coefficients uh, as the number of subjects goes to infinity. We tried this on an experiment where we actually knew the truth. And so this was a great experiment to try in one sense um, uh, in that we actually knew that there should be an effect. It was a bad experiment in another sense because there's relatively few subjects. So aphasia is a, uh, a form of, of dementia that impacts uh, language ability. That's the primary symptom. Uh, so here we have a study with 36 primary progressive aphasia patients. Uh, and, and there's different subtypes of aphasia, for example, uh, subjects who have word finding difficulties, subjects who have uh, difficulty producing gr grammatical sentences. Um, and semantic, but um, let's ignore that for the time being uh, and think about the um, uh, just comparing the uh, uh, the intervention versus a sham intervention. So in this case, the intervention was transcranial direct stimulation, which um, implied that we actually knew that connectivity had to be perturbed after the intervention. So they were actually using direct stimulation to perturb connectivity. Um, and then in this case, there was a language therapy for both the TDS, TDCS subjects versus CHAM. Uh, just to give you a little bit more background about the study, the ideas of thinking of TDCS as a therapy for uh, aphasia. So th this was a longitudinal study where they were, of course, looking at the um, persistent effects of TDCS um, in a crossover study, but we're simply going to look at the cross-sectional variation where we look at concurrently, immediately after TDCS, the comparison of TD TDCS versus sham. Uh, the original versions of CAP uh, kind of needed, needed sort of smaller matrices to work with. Yi has since extended it greatly to, to whole voxel level models and very high dimensional regional level models. But initially we looked at low dimensional uh, variations. So we, in this case, looked at the 13 language areas and six default mode network areas. I should note that the area of stimulation where they stimulated the brain in this case was the inferior frontal gyrus. So included in the regions that we we're looking at, these were all MRI cloud regions uh, from that processing software, um, included the area of stimulation. Um, so this is the kind of output that CAP gives you. It gives you a series of uh, uh, sort of air quotes, eigenvector loadings um, on, the, uh, on the regions and then the associated uh, coefficients, and then we have some confidence bands that we added on top of it. So for example, this is the, uh, the vector that had the really strongest effect with the comparison between uh, treatment and sham treatment. So TDCS versus control. And um, uh, uh, if you look at the loadings, the loadings were primarily in the inf inferior frontal gyrus, um, and then there were some also high loadings in the mid frontal gyrus where um, uh, in, in the mid temporal gyrus uh, 
that we have some neuroscientific theory that backs up why this would uh, why this would be the uh, uh, why this is a very reasonable set of regions to uh, for this to see the effect. Um, just so you can just to give you the interpretation, what does it mean? What do the blue and red mean? So, so some of these are negative or some of these are positive, and you have sign invariance, as is always the case with principal components. So ROIs are seeds. So assuming I have a positive beta coefficient, which of course didn't happen in this case, but imagine it was positive. So ROI seeds with the same effect, both red, both blue, all else being constant, including other components, increasing X suggests an increase in connectivity between those regions. And then ROIs with different signs, one red, one blue, all else being held constant, including the other components, increasing X suggests a decrease in connectivity between those regions. So it's, it, you know, it's a little bit more complex to interpret than regression, but we are looking at a complicated uh, topic and it does dramatically reduce the multiplicity problem. Instead of looking at uh, connections one at a time, we're reducing it down uh, dramatically. So you do also get the benefit of elim not eliminating, but reducing multiplicity concerns. Uh, there's an R package. And then uh, the last thing I want to talk about is um, a alternate way to think about this problem. Um, uh, so we want to consider connectivity as an outcome in this TDCS uh, example. Um, uh, one thing we were concerned with, for example, in this study, is that you may not have sort of zapped the same region across subjects. So we wanted to start thinking about uh, approaches that were uh, insensitive to the locality. And, and so um, we took the connectivity matrix and instead of thinking about uh, consistent locality, we just took all the connections within areas that we're interested in and then just looked at the distribution, the density of those connections. So we, now we would like to relate the density to the outcome and we call this density regression. So the way we decided to do this was to invert the predictor response relationship using uh, case control logic. So uh, in this case, even though there was 50% treated and 50% control, we simply treat the treatment as the outcome and then have the, you know, uh, whatever confounders we'd like to include, plus a uh, functional regression model with some function of the density integrated with a coefficient function. So this is just standard uh, functional regression where the inputs are a subject specific uh, density or distribution. And, and I just put down here the argument of why you can reverse the predictor response relationship, but it's just the standard um, case control logic. However, we also argue that the assumptions you need are only on the inner product between the density and the coefficient function, not on the density itself, which is, I don't know, maybe weakens the assumptions a little bit. The, so um, one big point I'd like to say is that Bohau, who worked on this, uh, found that probably the most preferable uh, version of T of the density to work on was the log of the subject specific connectivity density evaluated at the quantile function. So this is equal to, um, let me see if I can say this without messing up once, the negative of the log of the reciprocal of the derivative of the quantile function. So, uh, so in, in other words, it's the log of the density evaluated at the quantile function. And that sort of highlighted tail behavior. And I'll just show you, I'll end uh, with the final picture um, th we tried different uh, strategies. And remember, this is a setting where there should be a difference. There, there should be a difference because we zapped people. Um, but we sort of consistently, both in simulations and in the real data, saw that if we use the log quantile transform that we got sort of in the upper quantiles of the data, um, uh, uh, this is the coefficient function, um, the, uh, so we're seeing the significant area of the coefficient function is in the upper quantiles of the, of the density. Um, uh, so we, at any rate, it just worked out better both in, in the terms of simulations and I think conceptually we've argued ourselves into believing that it, that it works out better than as well, uh, but, uh, uh, but it also seems to work out better in the data when we, when we know there, there should actually be an effect. But I do think that the, um, the combination of, of thinking about this problem as a density regression problem is somewhat novel, but also, you know, I, I just, I think a technique that we maybe don't use often enough is, is case control logic in some of these uh, 
in, in some of these studies. So that's all I have. Um, we have several future directions that we're applying. And um, you know we're very interested in this. If anyone would like to talk with us or or or, or think about these problems with us, uh, and I'll just say thank you. Our third speaker today is our very own Dr. Rob Crafty, and. Rob joined Emory University last September, and he's now the endowed Rollins Professor and Chair of our Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Rollins School of Public Health. And Rob was previously on faculty at the University of Pittsburgh and Temple University. And his research focus on methods on analyzing high dimensional time series, signal and functional data. And he also does a connect um, scientific research in mental health, behavior health, and also mobile health. Rob has been a PI of multiple NHR1 awards. He led a group of interdisciplinary researchers in sleep studies, so he's really an expert in sleep studies. And Rob has been serving on the editorial board of a various of journals, including American statisticians, and also like the top journal, Sleep. Um, Rob also has served in various of uh, uh, roles um, in the community, including the president elect of the ASA Pittsburgh chapter. So I have, hope I have captured uh, all his service. Okay, so without further ado, Rob. Great, thanks, Xing, and thanks, Hernando and Brian, for the great talks. Let's see if I can successfully share my screen. Um, am I sharing it? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for having me. So what I'd like to talk about today is um, a method for adaptively being able to do a spectral analysis of a high dimensional time series. And the, I will not pretend like this is my work. So, um, well, I guess I'm part of the work, but it very much is the work of Zeta Lee. It was part of his dissertation. Zeta is currently assistant professor in the Department of Information Systems and Statistics at CUNY Baruch. Um, our other collaborators on this are Fabio Ferrarelli, who's an MD PhD, who actually has been treating the patients and zapping their brains, the motivations for our work, and Ori Rosen, who is a Bayesian statistician. So the work I'm going to talk about, it's in a forthcoming paper that's going to be coming out in JCGS, um, and Zeta also has made some awesome code available. So I'd like to start with kind of my motivating clinical application. Um, so our patient population of interest right now are patients who are in the hospital, mental hospital, after experiencing a first psychosis episode. So they've had this first kind of break from reality. They're being treated in the hospital. Now, these sort of patients sometimes go on to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. That has to be treated throughout their life. Sometimes it's just a one or one off or several off times experiences and they don't go on to develop a clinical diagnosis of schizophrenia. And how you treat these people and how you approach them very much, you know, you want to figure out what is are their long term trajectory and how can you help treat them best. And so what we're doing here is these individuals are in the hospital and we put a high density EEG cap on them. Um, you can see that in the picture in the upper right. And what Fabio does is he hits them with a magnetic pulse um, called um, transmagnetic stimulation. And so he just stimulates a part of the brain. He's going to be stimulating a part on the motor cortex. And we want to kind of look at how does brain activity kind of, is it immediately affected and recover from this magnetic pulse? Now, TMS is used a lot. Um, primarily, I see it used mostly in the diagnostic, in the um, therapeutic world, but we're using it as a diagnostic tool. So the data that we have, um, so we have, in our case, we have a 64-channel um, cap, and we have a time series from each one of those channels. This is just kind of summarizing the data in one plane instead of across space, so across time instead of across space. And the data segment that we're looking at for a patient has 
Um, time, it's centered at time zero is when the pulse was given and beforehand is considered baseline. And then we want to look at kind of the recovery period. Um, so I guess the period immediately in response to, oh, sorry, immediately in response to stimulus as well as the recovery. So our goal here is to understand kind of the workings of the electrophysiological workings of this individual's brain and to also kind of consider do they have characteristics that are more in line with someone who's a healthy individual or someone who actually is a schizophrenia, who has been diagnosed with schizophrenia? Okay, so how are we going to model and treat these data? So first off, um, the data that we looked at previously are clearly non-stationary, right? They change over time. But for pedagogy and to motivate how we're going to approach this, let's first look at... Um, how we can approach doing a spectral analysis for a stationary time series. So let's say we have a p-dimensional stationary time series and we'll call it x sub t. So one way to represent these time series is through the Cramer representation, where you can represent your time series as a stochastic integral with some transfer function a of omega, and then you have your complex exponentials that you're kind of integrating over, and at the end is a um, mean zero orthogonal incremental process with unit variance. So our transfer function, this function A, for A for every omega is a P by P complex value transfer function. Our object of interest is the power spectrum, which is A, A complex conjugate transpose, right? So now your power spectrum is a P by P complex matrix. It's, um, it's a matrix function of, over omega. It's non-negative definite. It's also Hermitian as a matrix and it's periodic um, with period one. Now, kind of some of the important things we want to interpret from this guy. Um, one is if you look across the diagonal terms, um, those diagonal terms, if you take any individual function, that's just the univariate power spectrum of say the Jate series. And if you were to integrate that, what you actually get out is just the variance of that Jade series. So those univariate spectra basically break down the amount of the variability in that Jade series that's attributable to oscillations at a certain frequency omega. Um, we're also interested in interpreting the squared coherence, which if you kind of take this view that the diagonal terms are kind of like variances, well, the squared coherence you can think of as like the squared correlation between two channels at a given frequency. So just to give a very simple example to motivate how to interpret a power spectrum, although I think Fernando did a wonderful job already in this, um, here's just some data. So what we have are data from a office in an engineering laboratory at the University of Pittsburgh, and we're measuring two things every 20 minutes. One is the amount of CO2, and in an indoor space such as this, it basically measures human respiration. So it measures the presence of humans. And the other thing we're measuring is VOC or volatile organic compounds, smelly things that are not good for your health. And if we have a look here, the first picture is the estimated log spectra for the CO2. And what you see is you see a very large spike at one cycle per day, which makes sense because people are coming in kind of nine to five or uh, if you're graduate students, maybe um, noon to midnight, but still in sort of a daily pattern. You also see some harmonics from that because it's not completely sinusoidal. And then you also have a spike over here, which is at a one over seven cycles per day or a weekly pattern because it's less occupied during the weekends. For volatile organic compounds, you also see a spike at one day and a less pronounced spike over here kind of at um, once per week. If you look at the squared coherence, there's a huge squared coherence at the daily cycles, right? So remember this is squared. So a squared coherence of 0.75 is huge. Well, that makes sense because a lot of these daily volatile organic compounds are because people are in there opening pens, printing things and whatnot. Whereas the weekly one is less pronounced because there are say other things such as traffic going around in the background that are driving that weekly pattern. So 
that is um, kind of how we can, can think about and approach a stationary multivariate time series in the spectral domain. But our EEG data are clearly not stationary. In fact, our patient will have a big problem if we zap them with the magnetic field and their time series doesn't change at all. So to kind of extend these concepts to the non-stationary setting, we're going to adopt the local stationary model that was kind of first adopted by Maurice Priestley and colleagues back in the 60s, but then Reiner Dahlhouse really kind of brought rigor to it um, in terms of kind of using asymptotic and large sample statistics. The idea here is your transfer function that before that was just a function of omega, you now also make it a function of time as well. And here we're using this kind of traditional approach where you scale time to be on the unit scale. And so this then means if you say as T gets large, it's now not your time points go out longer and longer. It's that you get a, hot, a denser and denser sampling rate. So now our transfer function is a function of both time and frequency. And then our power spectrum is as well a function of time and frequency. So our power spectrum at any given time point U is now kind of a power spectrum of frequencies at that particular point in time. So how these signals evolve, they can evolve in many different ways. So for instance, consider this simple example. We have just a bivariate time series, P equals two. Here, the top series stays, stays stationary. So if you look here that this is time, this is frequency, it's constant across time, so it's stationary. The second series goes from having pronounced high frequencies to having pronounced low frequencies at an abrupt change. So let's say someone zaps your head with a magnet. Um, or things could evolve smoothly over time. So here, the top series, if you look at the very beginning, there are more pronounced low frequencies. And over time, you get more pronounced high frequencies, but it's done so in a smooth and continuous manner. While well, here, the second series is basically stationary-esque. So there have been lots of methods that have looked at how do I analyze a time varying power spectrum? So you can kind of group them into three camps. One is they're based on kind of these smoothly varying dynamics. Another is you can think, well, they're piecewise stationary. I can take this thing, I can block it up into blocks. Each block is approximately stationary. At the end of the day, you get something that's very blocky and abrupt. Now, there also are these adaptive methods, which kind of try to capture both the slow varying and abrupt dynamics, and also in a way, aside from just capturing them, allow you to kind of be able to say something about the dynamics. Like what's the probability that there is one single change point? Now, a negative side is with these kind of adaptive methods is they're very adaptive, non-parametric, freewheeling. Well, that becomes a problem when you have a whole lot of data. So these adaptive methods really have only worked well if you have maximum five series you're looking at and not too high of a sampling rate. Um, so our main goal as to what we're gonna discuss here is to develop a method that you can kind of capture both of these changes. Um, and so to go very quickly, cause I can see I'm running out of time. Um, the idea here is that we adopt a factor model. So whereas we had that transfer function A before that was P by P, we now make it P by Q, and you have a Q dimensional um, process at the end. Um, so it's factor models have been used a ton in the time series world for high dimensional time series. Um, they've been mostly formulated in the time domain, which then either results in, in a lot of the econometrics literature, it's just kind of a simultaneous factor model. So all of your series are in phase, or a lot um, kind of this kind of MAE sort of lagged model, which puts a very strong parametric assumption on the shape of your power spectrum. What we're doing here is making it kind of more non-parametric within the spectral domain. So our idea for estimating is that we kind of first take a choppier time series in approximately stationary segments. Now, this doesn't have to be exact. 
And our goal here is that the location, number, and location of these partitions is random. And that then at the end of the day allows you to be able to capture not only these abrupt changes if they occur, because it's this actual model we're looking at, but when you average over things, if you have something that's a smooth change, you know, kind of stone wire strauss, you can approximate any smooth function with kind of these finite bases is that you can, this partition will move quite a bit. And then when you average over it, you can capture the smooth dynamics. Um, and the idea here is that we will, if you take the finite Fourier transform of these block coefficients, we end up getting kind of this penalized, this Whittle likelihood function. Um, and based off of this Whittle likelihood function, we propose a novel kind of way of prior for modeling our transfer functions. And so to model those loadings. The idea here is that it's a tensor product of Bayesian penalized splines. So this is kind of the form of Bayesian penalized splines, the sines and cosines functions for real and imaginary components. Cosines for the real because they're um, even functions and sine for the imaginary because they're odd. And if you look at the prior on these coefficients, these first two terms are the priors if you just do a smoothing spline, right? You dampen the higher frequencies more. The last terms over here, these size, are the shrinkage parameters that we put gamma pro process shrinkage priors on. The idea behind this is that it shrinks things across the Q-mate line or across how many factors you have. And so the idea here is that you force your amount of information in the different factors to move quickly. It puts informa more information on the earlier factors and also then eliminates for you from having to create all of these assumptions for identifiability because you basically squash these things through your prior. Okay, and we use a SSAMC approach. Um, so it's a nice little kick to reversible jump MCMC and that you have this self-adjusting mechanism to avoid get things getting stuck in these high dimensional problems. Um, so, and then within each of these between model moves or within model moves where we fix our partitioning points, we actually can use a fairly efficient Gibbs sampling scheme because it turns out when you conditional on things, you can pull each of the P dimensions or our rows in parallel. And that P is the largest high dimensional aspect. And so things are actually not that bad. So at the end of the day, we have this time varying power spectrum across space and locations. And so there are many ways to look at these data. You can slice it across space, across time, um, across frequency. What we have here are um, spectra for three locations, one in the primary modal cortex, frontal and the parietal. And you can see here that we actually have two very clear cut points. Um, I think it was it, the posterior probability of having two change points here was over 90%. And so you can see that kind of the dynamics were very much that there's this abrupt change when you get hit with the magnet, but then also it's not a smooth recovery, but a rather abrupt recovery. Now, if I slice things across by averaging across frequency, so here taking things within the beta band of these very low frequencies between 16 and 31 hertz, um, this is kind of the kicker, is that what we have here is this beta power across the whole brain before being hit with the magnet in this kind of abrupt stage and then after. If I look at the difference between the before you get hit with the magnet and the abrupt stage, you can see that over here in like the more um, primary cortex, you have kind of like the highest change, which makes sense because that's where he got hit with the magnet. But there's also very little change up in the frontal. And that kind of pattern of having little change up in the frontal is very indicative of going on to develop a possible diagnosis of schizophrenia. So this is just kind of our first pass at how do we do an adaptive spectral analysis of high dimensional time series. And we introduced this factor model and all of these in this fancy prior distribution to be able to capture things. Now, the next obvious things to ask are how do we analyze multiple subjects? So right now we're just looking at this one individual, whereas we wanna look at say associations with predictors 
How do I kind of predict brain activity, say preclinical aspects, but then also using your time varying spectrum as predictors to be able to predict um, optimal treatment. Um, we also want to introduce kind of, so right now we slice things using traditional frequency bands, but these sort of frequency bands have been adopted for different things. Um, or we're also now working on, is there a way that we can do regularization to learn optimal frequency bands for these settings? Um, so great, thank you so much.